welcome everybody who's joining us in Auditorium A at Kanapa Church Online. It is going to be a good day this morning. I'm excited to preach. Um, we're about to start a two-week series called God With Us. I'm preaching this week, obviously. Pastor Mike's going to be back next week, and he is very excited to preach. He said if you know someone who doesn't know the Lord to bring them next week, he's going to be a cannonball of gospel presentation. So he's very excited for that. But for this week, if you could turn with me to Matthew 1, verses 18 through 21, we're going to be hearing about and talking about the birth of Jesus. I know it's been a while since I've preached, so allow me to introduce myself for those of you who are hearing me for the first time. My name's Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I oversee microchurches. Uh, I have two amazing little girls, Alethea and Adelai. I have a wife, Tracy. We've been married 11 years. There's my beautiful family right there. Um, we Tracy and I actually, so we, we've been together 11 years. We've been married 11. We've been together for about 12. We met in college, and um, she was a freshman. She had just gotten saved, just coming to college. I was a junior. She, we met at Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I was doing announcements on stage. She kind of elbowed her friend. She goes, that's the one I'm going after. And she pointed at me. The question is, can you blame her? The answer is no. <laughs> But the first time, humility is one of my strong points, right? Uh, the, the first time we met was actually at FCA, but we were on a winter retreat. It was one of these things where we met. This was a picture of us, baby faces, 15 years ago. Um, this was before the dawn of iPhone, so she actually had to give me a picture of it, right? So we met, didn't really think anything of it. Everything's very platonic at this point. I dated a few girls in college. I think the reason the Lord didn't bring us together in college, because I was an idiot, and I probably would have messed it up pretty hardcore. Um, so I think that was sovereignty of the Lord right there. Um, I did have a homeless ministry here in town, and I wanted to hand that off to somebody. I was moving to California to start seminary. And so Tracy had volunteered. We exchanged numbers to kind of make sure the homeless ministry went good. Everything's still very platonic up to this point on my end. She was waiting for me to kind of see the light. Hadn't seen it yet, but it was coming. Um, so I'm moving to California. My mom said, hey, if you're moving across the country, come home and get your stuff out of my house. So I went to my mom's house, had a moment of nostalgia, you know. I, so I, I had like my shoebox full of pictures from um, college, and I'm starting to go through these pictures. And my mom walks into the room right as I get to this picture. And she sees this picture. And she goes, whoa, 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 who's this girl? I said, was this girl, Tracy? She's like, why didn't you ever date her? So time out. My mom is not one of those like overbearing, micromanaging moms. She never really told me who I should date, never kind of had that advice. So this was like really out of the ordinary for her. So time back in, I was like, well, um, I don't know. I don't know why, mom. I just, I just didn't see her that way. She's like, okay, well, here, here's what I want you to do. I want to have some Tracy babies. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? She said, yeah, I want grandbabies, Tracy babies, grandbabies. And she walks out of my room. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> like, it was the weirdest thing. So I pack up my stuff. I was like, see you later, mom. You know, I mean, it's just kind of a weird deal. But I start my trek out to California. It's a three-day drive, 18 hours a day or 16 to 18 hours, I think. As an introvert, that was a dream. So I was just driving to California by myself, thinking about stuff. And I'll never forget, I was in the middle of Texas and driving. And I started to think about this, and I was like, why didn't I date that girl? I was like, man, she's really good looking. She's a beautiful girl. She loves Jesus. She's very loving towards people. She's very smart. I was like, man. So I started chewing on this and chewing, and I just eventually, I blurted out, like out loud, I said, I'm going to marry that girl. And I was like, looking in the back seat, I was like, who just said that? Like, it just, it kind of freaked me out, because I'm not one of these people at that point who, like, heard from the Lord. This is one of the first times I heard from Jesus, and so it was one of those things, and it kind of freaked me out. I wasn't going to be the guy who walked up to her and been like, hey, the Lord told me we were going to get married, right? So, <laughs> so just a disclaimer, youngins in here, don't ever say that, okay? Just don't ever say that. So for me, I was kind of like, okay, God, if you want this to happen, you're going to make it happen. And so he did. We started dating long distance, so I was in California, and she was in Florida, and so it was one of those things where we just, we just made it work. This was before the dawn of Skype and FaceTime and all that stuff, so we would fly out as much as we could from Florida to California, red-eye flights, all that good stuff. Um, so eventually, um, I proposed in a private cove on Malibu Beach at sunset with a picnic and dancing. Nailed it, <laughs> right? I mean... <laughs> No, but, uh, but we had a short engagement. We only were engaged for three months. So one of the last trips out to California that Tracy took, um, it was kind of an interesting trip. She comes out, and Tracy, if you know her, she's very bubbly. She's very hospitable, all that good stuff. But she was very kind of reserved, kind of standoffish, aloof. And, I was, and so I kind of asked her the first day. She was out for a five-day trip. 
I said, hey, babe, is, is everything okay? She's like, well, I mean, no, but I'm not really, I'm not ready to talk about it. Just give me some time. I was like, okay. And, you know, that's like the worst because now I just start thinking, like, what did I say? What did I do? And so you're just, it, it's just the worst when somebody doesn't, tells you something's wrong but doesn't tell you what it is. So I give her a few days, and finally on the fourth day of this five-day trip, she comes to me, and, and if you know Tracy at all, she's very confident. So she comes, she didn't even really look me in the eye. Her hands are ringing. She's kind of doing one of these. And I'm like, babe, what is going on? Like, what is, what is happening? She's like, okay, so do you trust me? I was like, yeah, uh, of course I trust you, babe. What's up? So she takes another deep breath. She looks down. She looks back up, and she says, I'm pregnant. And after a long silence, I was like, um, so, so we haven't gotten close to having sex, so I, I know this is not my, it's not my baby, so, so whose baby is this? And this is brutal for me because I had complete trust in Tracy. I, I, I never in a million years would I have thought that this would have happened. I was stunned. I started to tear up. I got, I got angry. I got, I got frustrated. So many emotions were reeling in my head. I felt betrayed. I felt like shouting, crying. My, my emotions were a mess. And then she says, I know this sounds crazy, but I wasn't with anyone. And I was like, babe, I know where babies come from, right? So, so that's, I'm not an idiot. Please don't disrespect me any more than what's already happening right now. And then she tells me, this is, this is why I asked you to trust me. See, I wasn't with a guy. It, it was God. I'm, I'm going to have a son, and, and he's going to be the Messiah. So I paused. That's, that didn't happen, okay? <laughs> but I wanted to give you some backdrop of this context of a virgin birth to know how crazy, how wild, and how dramatic this had to have been for the people involved. Right? We hear this story every year, and we're like, oh, yeah, Mary had a baby of a virgin. It was Jesus. Like, and we miss the craziness that happens around this story. All right, disclaimer, Tracy never was pregnant before we got married. <laughs> She was a virgin when we got me. She, she was pure. She, all that stuff. So don't walk out of here and be like, can you believe Pastor Matt's wife? I mean, she, like that. Not true. Not true. Everything up to the baller engagement was true. Uh, but nothing after that. But can you imagine being Joseph and having your fiance who's betrothed you come up and drop this bomb? I mean, we're reading this passage, and again, we read the Christmas story, and we feel like this is great, but this is a lot of drama leading up to the birth of Jesus contained in these four verse, verses, but there's so much beauty that comes out of this. Check this out, Matthew 1, 18 through 21, it says this, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they had come together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's pray. Father, we want to have this story come alive afresh in our hearts this morning. Lord, let us get past just kind of the rote cultural understanding and dig into this text. And God, I pray that you are going to speak to us today. Let your spirit lead and guide. We offer ourselves up to listen to what you're saying. Amen. I want to welcome everybody in Auditorium A who's joining us as well. Online, Kanapa, thank you for being here with us. Hopefully you caught that verse. But I'll tell you what, man, if I'm a dad, I'm a dad of two daughters. If my daughter came home to me and said, oh, I'm pregnant and it was God, I, the first thing I would do is go find the chump who did this, like, and, and I'm just going to stop there, right? I mean, dads, can I get an amen for that one? Like, that's, <laughs> that's beyond me. But this is what it says in Matthew, verse 18. It says, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she'd been found to be a child from the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this is a pretty dramatic story, if you ask me, but Matthew, the author of this book, is not just trying to craft a dramatic story. He's actually doing something pretty amazing in this passage. He's a masterful storyteller who's giving us a glimpse into one of the most amazing moments in human history, when God came down and met us in our brokenness so that he could come and restore things and one day make us whole. But Matthew does even more than that. He's not just recounting the historical events of Jesus birth. He's weaving the entire story of God's redemptive narrative into the single act. He is revealing the radical na- nature about what is about to happen and how it's going to change history and eternity forever. Okay, now this is too rich for me not to nerd out with you guys for a second. So all you APES teachers out there, much love. We're going to teach a little bit right now. I'm going to put the glasses on. This means I'm hardcore nerding out with the text, okay? So the author Matthew had a specific audience in mind, right? He's unashamedly writing to Jewish believers. And this is important to know because his writing style and his technique were catering to Jewish believers so that they could make the connections that Jesus was the Mashiach, was the Messiah that they had been waiting so long for. So even the words he uses are nuanced and speaking to the historical, theological, and narrative history of the Israelites. He writes things like, now the birth of Christ took place in this way. And the word he used in the Greek for birth was Genesis. So if you're a first century Jew, Jew, you're already thinking now about the book of Genesis and the creation story. See, Matthew is intentionally making strong allusions to the creation story and making connections in the Jewish reader's mind, tying together the birth of Jesus with this story in Genesis. All right, so Genesis 1, 1 through 2 says this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Dark, darkness was over the surface and the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So Matthew's taking this illusion of the fact that the Spirit hovered over the waters in this act of creation, and he's saying that the same Spirit is hovering over Mary's womb in an act of recreation. You see, Genesis tells the creation story of the world and how things went horribly wrong, and Matthew is overlaying this with the birth of Jesus in the beginning of the recreation of the world and how God will one day put it back together again. And this begins with this man, this God, this Messiah named Jesus. And Matthew 1, 19, 20 goes on to say this. It says, Mary's husband, Joseph, being a man, a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This shows a lot of character on Joseph's behalf. I mean, I would have flipped my lid if Tracy came to me and said, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant, and by the way, it's God. I mean, how many of you would have a hard time if your wife, if your fiance, if your bae comes to you and drops that on you? It was God, right? Touch your neighbor say, don't ever say that. Just, just go ahead and do that real quick. Go out to me. Just, just, just go ahead and say that, right? And if your guy was next to you, it might have been a little awkward, but they, they probably shouldn't say that either, right? So... But here's the beauty of it. It says, verse 21, it says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay, this is rich. Are you ready? Jesus. Jesus. What a beautiful name that is. Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua is a compound word. It's ye, short for Yahweh, and Shua, the root word for saves. So Jesus' name literally means Yahweh saves. It's okay to say amen to that. That's great news. Matthew's making the bold claim that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is making the claim that Jesus is the pinnacle of Israel's history, the king of Israel that came to do what no person or no king could do before him. You see, God gave his people a lot of chances to save themselves, but we always blew it. He gave Adam and Eve the chance to live in perfect harmony with God in the garden, and they blew it. He gave Saul the title and the honor of being the first king of Israel, and he blew it. David was the king, the man after God's own heart, 
and he blew it. The kings after David, they blew it. They all had the opportunity to be the one, to be the Messiah, to be the rescuer, but they always fell short. And now we're in the first century AD with an Israel that is partially in exile, waiting for Yahweh to save his people, waiting for their Messiah to come. So there are hundreds of years now of pent up sorrow, of anger, of frustration, of hope and eagerness to have Yahweh saved. And Matthew is saying, your Messiah is here. Jesus is here. Yahweh saves is here and he's going to save you. His name was literally the fulfillment of their desire. Oh man, Matthew is saying the exile is over. Rome and all your oppressors, both externally and internally, are going to be overturned and that the kingdom of God is here all through this one line and name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now it's interesting that Matthew functionally repeats himself to make a point. This is intentional. He says, Yahweh, name him Yahweh saves for he will save his people. Right, so clearly Matthew's emphasizing this idea of salvation, and this leads us to the key aspect of this passage. And to do it justice, we have to be honest with ourselves, okay? This word salvation has been convoluted over the years and whittled down to a bare bones understanding that robs us of the idea of salvation and the beauty and the meaning that really lies within. See, when we say that Jesus will save his people from their sins with our post-enlightenment Western church mentality, we've pigeonholed salvation into something that it's not fully. Because salvation is more than when you, it's, it's more than where you go after you die. I just want you to write that down. Salvation is more than where you go after you die. Okay, who does the saving? It's Jesus. Who gets to experience it? You do, if you receive it. The key question this morning is, what does it mean to experience salvation? Let me break this down quickly, okay? When Matthew first said this, he said Jesus is going to save his people from their sins. And he's making that epically bold proclamation. Because sin and salvation was viewed very differently back in the day of Jesus in the Hebraic mindset. And their understanding is a more accurate and complete concept of salvation. See, for a first century Jew, salvation is holistic. Write that one down too. Salvation is holistic. Nowadays, we think of it as simply guilt before God. We think of it as a transgression that was breached against God. Which is true, but that's not the entire picture. Likewise, we've also incorrectly defined salvation as merely a place where you go when you die, which is a very incomplete and individualistic picture of salvation. Yes, going to heaven is part of salvation, but there's so much more to this word. And honestly, I think the world and the majority of church-going people have never seen, experienced, or tapped into the true meaning of what this is. I'm convinced of this. I think God offers us abundant life. He literally says that, but a lot of us are barely living. He has a seat reserved for us at the table of a feast, but we have chosen not to sit in our reserved seat, but to sit on the floor and just eat the crumbs that fall off the table. There's so much more that God has for us here and now. So how many of you have ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody ever seen that? Oh, wow, a lot of you. Auditorium A, Knapp, have you guys ever been? Okay, so I went there once. It was one of the most breathtaking things I've ever seen. The vastness of the canyon, the depth, the images, the expanse was like nothing else I've ever seen, right? I fell off the side of the canyon, and this wonderful lady saved me. She brought me back up. Salvation came to me that day. <laughs> right? Bless you, Katie Dayton, right? <laughs> but, but I got pictures of the canyon. I got, I got real pictures of the canyon, and I wanted to show them to my friends. I was like, look at how amazing this is. And they would look at the picture and go, wow, that, that's cool. And I was like, no, 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 it's not just cool. Like, it, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. I mean, do you see? And, and I tried to describe with my words something that failed. Like, I, uh, you can't describe the Grand Canyon with a two-dimensional picture and your words. I mean, have you ever had something that was so great, and you're just like, but the colors are like, ah, I mean, whoa. And, and the expanse was like r really deep. I mean, you're trying with your words, and it's just failing you, right? It's kind of like when you fall in love, and you're trying to explain it with your friend. You're like, she is so Ah, she's great. And they're like, okay, she's great. And I'm like, no, it's more than that. Like, you know, it's, there's something about when we can't just portray with words something that's so beautiful, it's so vast, it's so great. We see this with the Grand Canyon. We see this with love and we see this with salvation. 
Sometimes you just have to experience the richness of something to truly grasp and portray that beauty. Matthew is trying to portray this beauty in verse 21 when he says, She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Here's the, here's the sad thing. Matthew captured the beauty and the magnitude of this sentence, but I think the bite and the power of this sentence has, lost, has been lost over the last few centuries to a lot of Jesus' followers. It's been lost in cultural translation, right? But for a lot of Hebrew Hebrew readers and Hebrew writers like Matthew, this was the most subversive and most liberating sentence you would have ever read in your life. You see, sin is so much more than guilt and innocence before God. First and foremost, it's about a breach of relationship, but not only with just you and God, but with the people around you, even the earth itself. And salvation is more than about going to heaven when you die. It's holistic. It was about the healing and renewal of your mind and of your heart and of your body and of all your relationships with God, the people around you, the world around you. It was about bringing the family of faith together, community. It was about the riddance of all evil, poverty, and disease, the dissolving of death and its power, the, dis, uh, the dissolution of systemic evil and corruption, and it brought the healing to the cosmos itself. This is what salvation does. This is what it is. This is why people in the New Testament tried to force Jesus to be king, right? John six fifteen says, perceiving that they were about to come to take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Why would they try to force him to be king? Because they had this holistic idea of salvation. They knew that once they got the Messiah on the throne, that all things would be made new. He would bring about a new world order where the rule and the reign of Yahweh would crush the Roman Empire. It would crush all the sin and sickness that we had. It would make all things new. And Jesus was and is going to do that. But what these believers in the first century failed to realize is that he had already started to do that even before their attempt to make him king. This is cool. Mark 1, 14 through 15. Some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It says this. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee. This is Mark 1. This is the beginning of his ministry. Right? He says, proclaiming the gospel of God. Saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, when we hear the word gospel in America, we think of what? We think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? We think of salvation. But what we really mean is that our sins are taken away. See, here Jesus is calling people to believe in the gospel, but Jesus has not been killed. He has not been buried. He has not been resurrected yet. His sacrifice to cleanse us from our sins has not taken place. So what in the world is he talking about? What's the gospel then? Because he hasn't done any of these things. So where is the gospel? Why is Jesus saying repent and believe in the good news? The gospel is here. Because gospel literally means good news. It, it's the good news. But what is the good news if Jesus hasn't been resurrected yet? What are we repenting about? What are we believing in according to Jesus? And it's that the kingdom of God is at hand, which means that the rule and the reign of the king has been established here on earth. And it's at hand, which means it's breaking into our everyday lives, here and now. It has arrived and it has begun. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey guys, good news, the king is here and his rule and his reign is starting immediately. Salvation is holistic, and salvation is for here and now. I really hope you get this this morning. Salvation is for here and now, not just when we die. John 17, 3 is something that Pastor Franco said a few weeks ago. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life, salvation, is not a destination. It is a relationship with a God who saves when do we enter into this relationship with God? When our tongues confess and our hearts believe that Jesus is the king and we line ourselves up and we line our lives up under his rule and his reign. Salvation is for here and now. It is definitely for eternity and it will bring you to heaven, but there are so many of us that are missing that heaven begins now. This is why this was so 
revolutionary. It was the end of exile in your life. It is the end of all things terrible and wrong in your life. And it is the breaking in of this whole new reality that Jesus begins and starts when he comes here on earth. We are saved from death. Spiritual, but also emotional and mental death that has been introduced to our lives throughout the years. Salvation is holistic. It's not the place where you go when you die, but transformation starts way before we die. See, salvation affects every part of your life, and if you let Jesus begin to save you from your sins, and he will also not just do that, but he'll save you from the sins that were done against you. Did you know that? Most people relegate Jesus to the spiritual aspect of their lives and do not let him do a healing work in their body and their mind and their hearts, but he wants it all. And you might be like, hey, that sounds great, Matt, but, but there's not really hope. That sounds good for somebody else, but not for me. See, I've always been this way. I've gone to counseling. I've tried to kick this habit before. I've tried to think of thoughts. It doesn't work for me. I think I'm okay with just functionally waiting till heaven to get better. I'll just grit my teeth and get through it. But when we live like that, friends, we're not truly living. We're not living the way that Jesus has set this up, where he said, no, 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 no. You don't have to wait until heaven. You don't have to wait until you die. I want you to experience freedom and life and goodness and wholeness here and now. When we live like that, where we say, I'm just going to make it through Jesus, we're not tapping into the power that God had released the day that Jesus came into our world and when he saved his people from their sins. We're living a half-life of Christianity, and this is not what Jesus came to release. He came to give us life and life abundantly because salvation is not just about where you go when you die. It's an experience. It's a lifestyle that we live here and now. And it's not only about saving you from your sin, you have to see that this process of salvation, yes, it saves you from your sin, but salvation reveals your true identity. Salvation reveals and tells you who you really are. As I said in the beginning of the sermon, I have two daughters, right? I have Alethea, she's five. I have Adelaide, she's about 18 months now. When Alethea was born five years ago, I didn't know a thing about being a father. I had never changed a diaper in day in my life. I remember we had complications. We had a lot of things that were going on. She was in the NICU for 11 days. My wife was on bed rest before. Then her water had broke 10 weeks before that. Like we had a pretty epic kind of thing going on. She had uh, surgery, an in utero surgery at 23 and a half weeks. I mean, we, we, were, we went through the ring. Our first time was not an easy time. So when that little baby who fit in my arm right here, when I brought her home, I was like, they're going to let me take this human home? Like, I can't take a NICU nurse with me? What if something goes wrong? What if there's complications? Like, I'm not ready to be a dad. But that day that she was born, my identity shifted. It changed. I was a father, period. I will never become more of a father or less of a father than I did the day that she was born. Regardless of how much or little I knew, my status as a father remained unquestioned. I am the father to Aletheia. I am the father to Adelaide. I will spend the rest of my life learning how to be who I already am. Learning how to live up to the calling that I've already received as a dad in this life. Right now I'm indebted to this guy, John Mark Comer, for a lot of these thoughts, and and he says this, I want to quote him, and he says, in the same way, salvation reveals your new identity as a son or a daughter of the king, and it now defines who you are. Wake up, listen, I, I need you to catch this next part here. Your identity is no longer rooted in the shifting sands of what you do, how much you have, or what you struggle with, but in who you are becoming in Christ. It's not rooted in your past or who you were. It's not even rooted in your present and who you are. It is rooted in your future and who you are becoming. I hope you're letting that truth settle into your soul for a second. Because your truest identity is not what you did or who you were. It's not even who you are or what you're doing. It is who you are becoming in the light of the salvation that you've received. 
Mary was not just a knocked up, unmarried, disgraced teenager, even though that was her present state in this story. That's not who she was. She was the mother of the Messiah. That was who she was becoming and her true identity. You know, you may be a victim of sexual abuse who is still struggling with that physical, emotional, and spiritual consequence of that heinous crime that was done against you. I wish that on no one, and for that I am sorry. But what happened to you, that is not your identity. I just want to speak that truth and that life over you this morning. You are not a potentially broken and hurting victim. That's not who you are. That might be what you're feeling right now, but that is not who you are. Your true identity is a whole, healed, strong woman or man of faith that God is leading you to be. You are a man or woman of freedom, of hope, of salvation, and of the goodness of the Lord. You may be an alcoholic or you may be struggling with substance abuse, but you are not a struggling addict. That is not your identity. You may be fighting that battle right now, but that is not your identity. Your truest identity is the victorious, overcoming son and daughter of God. You may be struggling with depression. You may have had a hard time getting out of bed. You might be in bed online right now, really struggling through this. Just because you have struggled with depression doesn't mean that that dictates or identifies who you are. That is not who you are. You are a person of peace with a sound mind from Jesus. That is who you are. Don't believe me? Take a look at what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32 to 33. He says this. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also not deny before my Father who is in heaven. It's pretty intense, huh? It's one of those verses that kind of makes you wring your collar a little bit. And you're like, man, I hope that if that day came, I hope that if there is a time where I had to stand up for my faith, I would do it. And we all have this idea of us being the hero, of being the one who's like, no, I'll never deny Jesus. You know, we all want to say that. But honestly, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. I don't think any of us really know what we do in that moment, right? Take Peter, for example. One of the most famous passages about Peter in Matthew 26, where Peter denies Jesus three times. A little girl comes up to him and says, aren't you one of his disciples? And he goes, no, that's not me. Somebody else asks him, he goes, no, that's not me. She comes back up, she's like, I'm pretty sure that's you. He's like, no, that's not me. The rooster crows three times. The Bible says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. Because he heard Jesus say, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Peter was crushed. He failed. He, he had the test and he failed. But then you see this beautiful scene after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus meets Peter on the beach, and he's fishing. Peter seems to have been, he seemed to give up on his identity as a disciple. He's like, you know what? I blew it. I'm just going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to fishing. I was good at fishing. I can do that. So he went back to his old life of fishing, but Jesus meets him there, and he allows Peter a second chance, right? Instead of denying Jesus three times, he goes to Peter, and he asks him three times. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? He's like, yes, Lord. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? He's like, of course I do, Jesus. I can just see him like tearing up because he's thinking about this third repeat of when he denied Jesus and now he's saying yes three times and afterwards Jesus says, follow me. And he completes this beautiful restoration of Peter into the faith. And in turn, Peter becomes the world changer that he was always destined to be. Now, the story's not just touching. This is theologically profound. See, Jesus, out of his own mouth, said, if you deny me, I will deny you. Peter did it three times. It's not like he was just like, oh, that wasn't me, that was John. Like, I mean, it was three times. He did it every single time. And so Jesus gives him another chance. But why would Jesus subsequently go against his own words and warning? Is Jesus not, I mean, is he not, is this not accurate? Is this not, is this kind of one of those holes in the Bible? No, I don't think so. Because salvation reveals your true identity, and no one knows this better than Jesus Christ himself. See, Jesus was viewing Peter through the identity of salvation, not who he was, which was somebody who epically blew it and denied Jesus, not who he currently is in this passage, which was a defunct disciple and a fisherman who had given up, but who he was and who he was becoming. And he saw him 
as a world-changing disciple. And Jesus said, listen, Peter, your past doesn't define you. Who you are right now doesn't define you. I define you. And the salvation you put your trust in defines you. And you are going to change the world. That gives me so much hope. (laughs) It gives me so much hope. To know that your past doesn't dictate who you are anymore. That what you're doing in your present It doesn't dictate who you are anymore. Salvation dictates who you are. And that's who you're becoming. This is the profound beauty of the gospel where we just get a restart. And salvation saves us from the tyranny of your sins, past and present, and how they try to shape and mold you. And Jesus says, no more, no longer. That is not who you are. But friends, this is the beauty of salvation, but this is also the truth and the reality of salvation. We can't do this by ourselves. You need to be saved. We can try to repeat the history of Israel, who for decades and centuries tried to save themselves, and they blew it again and again and again. Jesus finally came and said, hey, listen, I get it. You can't do this, so I'm going to do it for you. And that's the good news. The king is here. The king is ruling and reigning today. He is seated on the throne and he is calling out and speaking forth the destiny that he has for you. He's willing to take it all from you. All the things that are holding you back, all the lies that you have believed over the years have come to nothing because Jesus is speaking over that, the reality and the truth of who you are. God is not distant. He is not some God far off in the cosmos that doesn't interact with you. He is close and his name is Jesus. And he has come to save you from your sins. And he is already involved in your everyday life, whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you accept it Accept it or not, he is here. Now this word sin was not a religious term in the first century. It is now, it wasn't then. It simply means to fall, to screw up. How many of you have screwed up in your life? Okay, thanks. If you didn't raise your hand, you're, you're a liar. Um, so now you can raise it because now we're all on the same page, right? But the gospel claims that we need something other than ourselves to save us and to make things right. Now listen, here's the deal. I'm all for self-help, tips and techniques. That's great. However, they're not going to save you. Another sermon is not going to save you. Another podcast is not going to save you. We have all the knowledge we could ever desire or want at our fingertips. You get on your phone, you get online, you can have the greatest thinkers, the best religious theology you can possible want. It's all right there for the taking, but we don't need more or better knowledge. Our brain is not the issue here. Our heart is bent in the wrong direction and we need it to be changed and we need to be transformed. That's the beauty of Jesus Christ. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a baby in a manger. He is a savior. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He came to do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. He came to restore the world in a way that we have been trying to do and failing for millennia. He came to save you out of this world and the mess that we have made of it, right? He is inviting you to live out who you truly are. That's good news. That's good news. So altar team, I want you to come up. Auditorium A, altar team, come up. Kanapa, altar team, come on up. Auditorium B, come on up right now. Because I want to ask everybody here a very simple question. I want you to pay attention. I want you to listen. Don't just check out if you're already following Jesus. I want to ask you, where do you need to be saved this morning? From sin and its consequences? This might be the first time where you're like, you know what, I haven't been following Jesus and I need to make that commitment. I want a a Messiah who's going to meet me where I'm at and make me new. That might be you. And you might need to take that initial step of salvation. But it could be that you're already saved from your sins, but you're battling with the sins that have been done against you. Maybe it was in your family. Maybe it was at your workplace. Maybe it was with a a brother and sister in the Lord. Whatever it is, I want to ask you, where do you need to be saved this morning? Remember, salvation is holistic. It means to be rescued. It means to be healed. Where do you need to be saved, healed, and rescued today? Because the old way of being human just isn't working anymore. This is what the scripture tells us. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. 
Do you need to be saved from a porn addiction? From an alcohol addiction? Does your marriage need to be saved from being loveless and empty? Do you need to be saved from a past hurt or a history of abuse that's been making you hard, making it hard to believe that anyone can truly love you? Is it being saved from the lies that your parents spoke over you that you're never going to amount to anything? Is it freedom and salvation from the fear of failure? Do you need to be saved from the fear of abandonment? You know, one of the brothers felt like he had a word of, for us today, and that was to repent. And, and, and he also said he had a word that he prayed this morning. I'm going to read it. He said, I was praying this morning, and I saw a snapshot of a bald or mostly bald man that has a heart condition. And he felt like the Lord said if he would step out in faith today that the Lord would heal him. That's what salvation is. It's the holistic healing of our body, our soul, our spirit, our mind. So I'm encouraging you this morning to come up and get prayer. Pray a prayer of salvation. Maybe it's to be freed from your sins for the first time. Maybe that's you're going to get baptized and you're going to say, I go down who I used to be, and I come up new in Christ. It might be that you've been following Jesus for 30 years, but there's a wound in your heart that hasn't been touched yet that needs to get healed. Come up and receive it today. We're all broken people. We all have skeletons and junk in our closet that have been dictating who we are for so many years, but we serve a God who says he will will save you from your sins. This means he will change your heart, but also set you free from the sins that have been holding you bondage for so many years leading up to this point. So I'm making the call to profess following Jesus, but also to profess that you're going to give him every little piece of your heart and your mind and your body that's holding you back from being the truest you, the disciple and the world changer he's called you to be. So Danley and Joel, you can take it from here. But for you in all eternity, I want you to stand. I want us to stand together. And I want you, man, friends, I really hope you don't walk out of here And you don't let God do the heart surgery he needs to do on you this morning. Okay, we've got people who are prayed up. They're ready to pray with you. But man, I want Jesus to set you free. If you're online, we've got people who want to pray with you as well. But I'm going to pray. The altars are open though. So if you want to come and you want prayer for salvation, for healing, for the holistic covering of Jesus, come up and do that now. Because he's here and he's ready and he's waiting for you to meet him so he can speak over the identity and the life that he has for you. So Father, we ask that you would allow us to experience salvation in its truest form, that it would allow us to be the truest us that you've called us and designed us and created us to be. So Lord, I just pray that your spirit would move among us and that you would allow us to taste and see that you're good today, Lord, your word says, surely I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let that be a reality for every single person in this room today. Bless your people so that we can be a blessing. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Bless you guys. The altar is open. Come on up. If not, we'll see you next week.